This is gold. It's for wearing. It's not for investing. Let me tell you how to make money. You see all these people, they've invested in equity. Simple 12% CAGR returns, long term horizon, you can become rich like them and like me. And if you don't understand how to pick stocks, invest in a simple index fund. I mean, paisa hi paisa hoga. What is this? This? Huh? Um, that's right. If you look at this data over here, you'll see that gold actually beat Nifty. But to understand that, you'll have to understand a little bit of history. And in this episode of De-Influencing, we'll talk about gold versus equity, the truth. We'll talk about the good, the bad, and everything in between, because these guys won't tell you. Hit that like and subscribe, and let's begin with step number one. Why is gold even precious? Think about how we use language and gold. We think of it as precious, that's why we say golden rule, gold standard, gold medal. I mean, think about the last time you said aluminium rule. Probably not. And gold is precious. And so was stuff like silver and copper. And actually, I have aluminium right here as well. The same stuff you use to, uh, you know, get your cafeteria food wrapped in and taken home. In fact, aluminium was precious just as gold way back. But then technology advanced and people were able to take out aluminium and the value of aluminium has now been reduced to my tiffin. But gold is not the same. It's still tough to mine and even more difficult to actually replicate. It's tough to make fake gold. It's nearly impossible and that's why it still has some value. Gold is also really chemically uninteresting. Now, if you look at any of these three things, like silver or copper, they'll actually degrade over time. And of course, aluminium will. But gold actually won't. Even a thousand years from now, it'll look the same. So because it's chemically uninteresting, is another property which gives it some value. In fact, one-fifth of all the gold is actually not held by people, but by sovereign wealth. And what I mean by that is this. We have all these countries like United States, Germany, Italy, France, even India. They hold all of this gold. And this is in metric tons. Think about how much gold United States actually has. That's 8,000 metric tons compared to everyone else. Every single country knows that gold is considered a safe heaven. Think about currencies, oil prices, geopolitical issues. All of these commodities can actually change. Even a currency can become volatile when there is a war or simply there is economic turmoil. But gold is actually one thing that unites all of these countries together. And because of that, these guys invest in a lot of gold and think, instead of holding their own currency, let me hold something that unites everyone, that's this metal. Now we know gold has value, but why do we need to include it in our investment portfolio? So let me teach you a concept. Think about equities. Equities is relatively more riskier than say a fixed deposit or say gold. Basically, it's a little more volatile. So how do you reduce that volatility? So first, let's look at Nifty and TCS. Now I've picked these two stocks because they're both equity and they seem like two different investments. One is index fund, one is TCS, a software company. But if you look at this chart, you'll see that both of these instruments are connected to each other. They are correlated. In fact, the correlation is 0.97, which means they almost move together. That's interesting. It has something to do with how it's weighted and how Nifty is constructed. But the point is, they are correlated. They'll go up together and down together. So now the question is, what's the correlation or the connection between equity, which is slightly more risky, and gold? So this is an interesting chart of three different asset classes. First is, we have emerging markets, short-term treasury, then we have government bonds, which is long-term, and then we have equity. Now the question is, how are all these things connected or correlated to gold? And if I put this right here, now if you look at all these asset classes connected to gold, this number shows us that they're all connected 
zero, which means they are independent of each other. If Nifty goes up, it will have no effect on gold. Or let me say, will have an extremely low effect, which is why it's a good thing to have in your portfolio because its movement is independent. The second reason you should have gold in your portfolio is that it reduces volatility. So we'll create this portfolio by putting 50% of our money in Nifty 50, which is the index, and 50% of our money into gold bees. Now we've taken gold bees as a proxy of gold prices. Of course, thoda prices idhar udhar ho sakta hai. We could have selected maybe spot, but it is easy to get this data. So just bear with me. And over here we can see the 50-50 weighted portfolio, how it's doing compared to just pure equity or pure gold. So let's see what we have over here. We can see that in 2008, Nifty gave us a minus 50% return. I want you to imagine, you've invested a large portion of your money, a lot of your savings in the market, and then suddenly you see minus 50%. And maybe you put the entire money in gold, you see plus 24%, not bad. But if it was equivated, you would actually see only a minus 13%. This means that you got the benefit of equity and gold and didn't lose too much money. We didn't make a lot. But notice, say, a year like 2010, where our portfolio made a 20%. Then let's say we look at 2016, where Nifty only gave a 4% return and gold 12 but both them put together gave you 8.5%. The point is very simple. The highs become a little lower and the lows become a little higher dampening or sort of reducing the volatility. What's interesting is that no one knows how Nifty will perform and no one knows how gold will perform. So should you even predict? Now the question is, should you have gold to sort of reduce volatility in your portfolio? I'd love to know what you think in the comments below. Another interesting thing about gold is its relation to inflation. Now, inflation is actually not a bad thing. Any growing economy will always have inflation. In fact, without it, growth cannot actually occur. It's a feature of capitalism. And in a fast-growing country like India, mehengai to hamesha hogi. But if you look at this chart over here, you'll notice that gold has beaten inflation 8 out of 12 calendar years. So if you're ever worried about Mangai, gold is a great hedge against this Mangai problem that you're having. And this is the most important point. Guys, full attention on your screen right now. You've made it this far. You love this point. Remember when we started the video, I said gold beat Nifty? Let me explain by what I meant. So one bit, okay. Of course, I have another chart over here. And this chart over here is gold versus Nifty. What do you think this is gonna look like? We have Nifty here. Now you can see that Nifty has done uh, fairly well over a long period of time. Let's look at gold. And these are gold returns. Let's see how gold has done. Also give a shout out to Vandit over here for all this work over here and the production team. Good job, good job. Aap log bhi clapping kar sakte. Now notice, uh, these are gold and Nifty stacked together. The key is, who is showing you what portion of the data? So if I only pick this portion, I can say, hey, Nifty beat gold. If I go slightly further, I can say, hey, gold just beat Nifty. If I take this portion over here, I can say, gold and Nifty mein to farak hi nahi hai. Nifty is awesome. I might go a little further in time, take a smaller sliver and say, hey, Gold is killing it and beating Nifty. The point is very simple. You can't really predict which asset will do what. So it's best you have some participation in gold. I'm not saying gold is better. I'm not saying Nifty is better. But you can't say one is extremely good and the other sucks. That is an incorrect statement. What you should probably say is one is relatively more volatile than the other. And yes, that is true. And then you decide according to your risk profile, whether you want 10% gold, 20% gold, or whatever you think makes sense. I hope this video actually cleared that part. But one thing we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about one thing. 
How do you even invest in gold? I mean, should you buy these bricks? Should you buy it online? Should you do this SGB thing? How does this work? And without discussing how to invest in gold, this video is just not complete. So let's move on to the next section. So the first way and the most obvious way for you to buy gold, like our friend at the beginning, is to actually buy jewelry or something like this. Now, physical gold has two problems. One is where do you store it? You'll have to keep a locker. And if you don't have a locker, there's always fear of theft. Apart from that, whether you buy physical gold or there's a digital equivalent as well called digital gold, both of these options will attract tax. So you'll have to pay some amount as tax on top of this. And there's also a cess on top of that as well. Something you should definitely know. And if you choose the jewelry route, which is this, then you're probably going to pay making charges too. Another option, which is probably the most interesting and probably the best option, is SGBs. SGBs or sovereign gold bonds are bonds from the government but backed with actually asli sona. So a sovereign gold bond have three features. The first, it's a bond. So you put in money and there is a maturity period and you have to hold till maturity, just like any bond. If you hold it till maturity, that is eight years, you are not taxed on the appreciation of the gold that it mimics. So if the value goes from 100 to 200, you keep that profit. If you hold it till maturity, you don't pay any tax on it. The second thing is, like I said, it actually mimics the price of gold, which means if you think gold is a good long-term asset, this is a great way to actually benefit from it. And the third is quite unusual. It has a 2.5% interest rate that is paid out to you annually. That uh, will obviously attract normal taxes, but isn't that interesting? There's an extra 2.5% that you're getting on this. So all these three things put together makes SGB probably the most attractive out of all the other options. Now, SGBs are released from time to time and just like an IPO, you can subscribe to them via this primary issue and you will get allotment and uh, you get that 2.5% too. But here's an interesting trick. So if the price actually falls of gold, then what you can do is you can buy the SGB in the secondary market, which means you'll buy it from another person who already owns it and the yield will actually go up. You know why? Because the 2.5% was on that 100 rupees, that initial primary offer. But if the market fell to 99, that extra 1% is something that you actually make. So it will become larger than the 2.5% because of that fall. Now, another reason of that difference could be that there is low liquidity in the market. And because of that, it's trading at a discount from its primary issuance level. Anyway, the point here is very simple. There's no best asset class. Every asset class has its own risk and reward profile and every individual like you has its own risk and reward comfort level. Find what that is and use a mix of different assets. Second, try to find out what you think about SGBs. It's an interesting thing. Apart from just looking at physical gold and jewelry, this is something you should read more about. And finally, don't listen to anyone telling you something is best. There is no best. And if there was, there wouldn't be a de-influencing series. So tell me what you thought of this episode and tell us what other things we should pick in our next series. Watch all these other videos in the de-influencing series. We love it. I even played Vasuli Bhai in one of these. Check it out and see you in the next episode. And don't forget to like and subscribe and say yay, Zero One Rocks. Bye guys. Thank you.